imams and, uh, and our salaf uh, Ajma'in said that this is coming to the close that Aqsa is the coming time between Asr and Nahr. So if we make our niya, our intention for Majlis Sudhikr, uh, a, a, a sitting of remembering Allah in terms of ilm, because ilm is dhikr, knowledge is remembrance. And also where we can just to make a small du'a as well without interrupting our train of thought. This will be beneficial in Shana time. And if we do finish, you know, five, ten minutes before Maghrib or whatever, uh, then try to utilize this time in this way that uh, we will have the, the fa'idah of ilm and the fa'idah of amal, the benefit of knowledge and the benefit of action. And the goal of knowledge and action is how the spiritual state. Uh, to have a state and uh, a hal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of humility, sincerity, uh, yearning, love. So I don't remember if I don't remind you again please uh, let's try to remind ourselves. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to be a bit uh, disturbing today, interrupting. Should we try to also have like other majlis as well? So, unless you have to lean back on, because you have a bad back or you, for any other reason, young or old, then try to come closer. Um, closer is, as you know, brings the hearts together. It's the adab of the majlis. And the reality is, as you, as you know from me, and I know from some of you that uh, are, your faces are familiar, that actually we're not in the process of learning for learning. It's not really our goal, but learning to be transformed. And Imam al-Shafi who says, لَيْسَ الْعِلْمُ مَا حَفِذَ الْعِلْمُ مَا نَفَعَ or مَا حَفِذُ الْعِلْمُ مَا نَفَعَ Knowledge isn't what you memorize, but knowledge is what benefits. And by benefit he means that we act upon that knowledge and it brings us closer to Allah. Allah Jalla draws us uh, closer to Himself. And I cannot uh, emphasize it, even though uh, some of you know I've, I've been blessed to study the Sharia sciences for almost 20 years now with some teachers. But I can't think of one, te one of my teachers who made knowledge the goal. Uh, and that's something which is uh, the nafs finds very, very difficult, especially if you're academic. And I'm appealing to some of you young brothers as well. If you're academic and mashallah, when you read, you understand, you memorize and whatever, sometimes it can become a goal in itself that we think we're doing it for Allah. Uh, but something else happens. And it's really, really important that we're always reminded of these uh, realities of it. With that being said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasleenu wa nasdaqfiru, wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina, wa min sayyati amalina, ma yahdi illahu wa fala mudilla la, wa ma yudhir fala haadiya la, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la shayka la, wa ashadu anna muhammad al-abduhu wa rasooluhu wa amma ba'ad, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Okay, so uh, as was advertised, for the next 10 odd weeks, maybe 11, maybe 9, or let's say 10 weeks inshallah, we're just going to look at the small booklet. Uh, this is the booklet, or this was at least the first uh, edition of the booklet, Agenda to Change Our Condition. It was written by uh, two contemporary scholars living in the States, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shaq. Uh, may Allah SWT preserve and protect them both. And they wrote this small little book. Really, it's a, it's, it's a book that helps us understand and actualize taqwa. And during their discussion on the reality of taqwa, of piety, of God-fearingness, of God-consciousness, of being mindful of Allah, this is the, the wider meaning of taqwa, they, uh, in, in one of the chapters, like, I think the, yeah, they started with, tw they start with 20 principles or 20 actions that can help change our condition. 20 practical steps, sorry, to change our condition. And I want to go through those 20 points. So we're not going to go through the whole booklet. Um, I'm not quite, um, there is a second edition of this booklet, uh, which might have some additions and some uh, amendments. So you can buy that in Sharmatana. And if the second edition is like the first, then almost towards the beginning are the 20 practical steps to change our condition. And these steps, 
apply to us as individuals, and apply to us as Muslim communities. Okay? So there are things here that, well, nearly all of the things apply to us as individuals. And some of these 20 points will apply to us as communities. Okay? And the idea is to change our condition. And this book was written specifically as a practical manual of how to better ourselves and improve ourselves. And that will be the focus in Charlottetown. There is a beautiful introduction by the two sheikhs. Um, I won't read the entire introduction, but I'll just start with a few, uh, I'll start with a, a paragraph or two so that we can just hear what they've, in, they intend by the book. Those of you who don't know Sheikh Hamza Yusuf or Sheikh, uh, Imam Zaid Shakir, uh, it's not a problem. Inshallah, just take it from me that they are good scholars. Okay, uh, when I say young, uh, they're both older than me, so they're both in their mid 50s. Uh, but they're young in the sense that they're not 70, 80. Kind of, you know, we still have ulama like that around as well, whose depth and wisdom is, you know, is at another level. So the two sheikhs, Hafzullah Ta'ala, and just one more thing from Adab. Remember when we started looking at the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi Rahmullah Ta'ala, and we said that. Um, Whenever we are going to read the words of a scholar, whether he's passed or whether he's living, uh, what do we normally do? What's the, what's the etiquette? Yes, yeah, so for a person who's passed away, generally it's rahmatullah alayhi rahimullah. This is we're benefiting from their words. And not only that, the haq, the right that a scholar has over us, especially if they've passed away, is that we invoke Allah's uh, mercy upon them. Okay? Uh, in this case, the two sheikhs are alive. Uh, so there are many ways of invoking a nice du'a, but in, in our hearts, if we make a du'a, because we're benefiting, and especially if we walk out of this room, and say, Allah, those words or that teaching brought me closer to Allah, then we could never thank a person enough who brings us closer to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I, I know he's not going to like this at all, but I have to say, um, uh, on my right, uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr, when we were fairly young, uh, going through um, critical times uh, in our 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, being born and raised in this country uh, back in the 70s and 80s. There was a lot to distract us, uh, but people like uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr here, uh, who was just speaking to you, would, would carry on just reminding us about Allah gently, smiling, faith, mashallah. And the seeds from people like him, bi'ithnillah ta'ala, jazakumullah khair. Uh, was, was sown in, in the hearts. Whether they came to fruits then or later on, that's in Allah's hands. Okay? Um, and so we have to appreciate. Man lam yashkur al-nasa lam yashkur Allah. Whoever doesn't thank people, doesn't thank God, doesn't thank Allah. And, you know, if you, you know, if you help me fix my front gate, thank you very much. But it's just the front gate, right? But if you help me fix the door of my heart to Allah, SubhanAllah, I need to, what, what kind of help could I, had greater, could I have had greater than that? So how much thanks should I be given? The ulama like that. The ulama, the scholars of Islam like that. So, Shaykh Hamza, Hafizullah Ta'ala, Imam Zayd, Hafizullah, uh, they both say, Islam is submission to reality. It is recognition and an, it is a recognition and an acceptance of the way things really are and not as they appear. Everything is in submission to Allah. It is only men and jinn that can rebel and often do rebel. It is only men and jinn who can rebel wittingly or unwittingly, intentionally or unintentionally. Over 1400 years ago, this path of Islam was renewed for a final time to mark the entry into the last stage of human experience in this dunya, in this lower realm. What does that mean? Over 1400 years ago, this path of Islam was renewed. What does that mean? Anybody? If you remember the poster, we said we're going to consider some points, we're going to reflect upon some points, we're going to internalize. So. Part of that reflection is, let me throw questions to you. What does it mean when I read something like, over 1400 years ago, 
this path of Islam was renewed for a final time. So in, uh, people around him were misguided from the from, from right guidance and the right path, and the Prophet of Allah, 1400 years ago, came and he uh, brought them Islam. But what about the idea of renewed? Renew, what does that give us an idea of? If we renew something, it means that what we renewed was already was already there, maybe in some broken form. Okay, in some form that needed to be somehow rectified or, or fixed. There were, there were scatterings of prophets, the teachings of previous prophets around. There were some of the revealed books that Allah sent to previous prophets والسلام, were around, but not in their original pure form. Some of the things that Allah revealed were known to people. Some of the things that Allah revealed had been changed, forgotten, misunderstood. So there were small pockets of light. The light of Tawheed, the light of understanding some of the teachings of previous prophets. But by and large, things have got, things have got to a fairly bad stage of darkness. And that's what needed to be fixed to return people or to bring back the light, the norm. That was what needed to be renewed. That covenant with Allah, that ahad with Allah. And as we will see later on, that we all, before we were born, in fact, before mankind came and appeared on the earth as we did, we made an ahad, a covenant, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, am I not your Lord? Indeed you are. Okay? And we did that before we took our bodily forms, in our pre-bodily forms, as occurs in the surah, in the verse of Surah al -Aram. And so Islam was the teaching of all of the Prophets, alayhi wa sallam, wa in the dina, in the land of Islam. The religion with Allah is Islam. The beliefs were, rough, the, were, were the same. Tawheed, Risala, Prophethood, Akhirah, Hereafter and Judgment do good, but the forms of good were slightly different. The Sharia was slightly different between prophets. Some things which were halal now, lawful now, some of those were haram. Okay? Some things which were halal then have become haram now. Why? So that the law could suit that particular society and people for their time and place. And then that law was universalized, was made for everyone at all times, the law or the Sharia given to the Prophet So when we say the Prophets were all Muslims, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but by that we don't mean that they had exactly the rules that we, we do, we come into the masjid and it's in our Sharia, it's recommended to pray to the masjid, there's a sa'a, there's a time at the uh, Juma that our dua is performed. All these details, they may not have been the same for previous prophets, but the beliefs were. Okay. So the path of renewal. Okay, that's what it means by the path of renewal. And it's the last stage of humanity. We are living in the twilight years of, human, of, of the human condition. That is to say, we're at the tail end, just around the corner from the Day of Judgment. That doesn't mean we oh, go home, sell everything, and the end is nigh. It just tells us that however long we humans have been around, okay, and how long, however long we've had prophethood and messengership, okay, it's all coming to the human drama. It's coming to an end. Okay? There's that end. And then there are our personal endings. Death. Many will die before the world comes to an end. Okay, so we have our own personal ending drama. But as, a, as human beings, the world itself, then that day of judgment drama will, is round the corner. And then they say, it was renewed by the best of creation. This is a title from the Prophet, one of the titles, Khairu Khalqillah. 
okay, uh, he is uh, Allah's Habib, Allah's beloved. And it's true, uh, because someone made a point here some um, before Ramadan and I said I would address it. Isn't every righteous person Allah's Habib, Allah's beloved? Yes. Uh, uh, Allah loves the person who does such and such, Allah loves the one who does such and such. Yes, absolutely. But when we say that the Prophet is Habibullah, okay, we don't just mean he's Allah's beloved, but it's actually Allah's most beloved. And even if, even if the hadith uh, which mentions that the Prophet is called Habib or Habibullah, hadith in the Sunnah of Timothy, has some mild weaknesses. It's not fabricated. It's not very weak, it has some mild weaknesses. Mild weakness in the chain. But the ulama, talaqi al qabul they've accepted this. The ulama, the scholars, not one or two, the scholars in general have accepted this. So much so, it's aqidah to me. It's aqidah with us, as you will find in um, aqidah bahawir, that he is Habibur, Habibur Rabbil Alameen. He is the most beloved of Allah, Lord of the world. So, if a, if a hadith, turns to be weak by its chain, but the scholars as a whole have accepted it, khalas, it's acceptable. Okay, it's acceptable. Uh, and, and as the Arab sayings goes, that, that if this is not your nest, move on. And if this is not your field and you don't understand, khalas, don't speak about it. Okay. Every bird should be in its own nest. Okay, and sensible. A little chick doesn't go in the nest of an eagle. And because it comes out all battered and torn up, whose fault is it going to be? Right? It's not going to be the eagle's fault. So likewise, we should kind of have a, an understanding of that. So he is Habibullah, he is Khayru Khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we say the best of Allah's creation, we're talking about it. Arsh, Kursi, Sun, Moon, Jibreel Alayhi Salam, Mikhail, the best of Allah's creation. Itlaq, absolutely, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who's them? First point of the heart, subhanAllah, what did I do? SubhanAllah, what did I do to deserve being a follower, a part of the Ummah, the Prophet Sallallahu Look at my life, look at who I am, and nothing. And yet Allah put me amongst the followers, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu who is Habibullah, who is Khayru Khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation. SubhanAllah, He is the Adamic perfection. He is the human perfection, alayhi salatu and yet still, look at the resistance within us. Look at the laziness. Look at how we choose someone else's sunnah over the Prophet's house and sunnah and okay. Before you, they say, they write, is a concise treaty concerning the path to the realization of taqwa. And then they speak about taqwa. And they say that this taqwa is the first command of the Qur'an. And this taqwa requires struggle against the self is the means by which we get this taqwa. And they say, reading from them, this struggle against the self is the ancient way of the prophets. Struggling against the nafs, the ego, the lower self, the bestial self, in the nafs al when we saw the Quran, we say, indeed the soul constantly incites towards evil. This is the, uh, the ancient way of the prophets, alayhi wa sallam, sallam. This is what the prophets came from. They came to teach us how to struggle against our soul so we can make it submit to Allah because that submission is what we call Islam. Islam is istislam lillah bi ta'atihi. It's submitting or surrendering to Allah by obedience to Him, bi tawheedihi, by singling Him out for worship, bi ikhlasihi, by sincerity. That's what Islam is. The result of that istislam or submission, inshallah, is salam, peace, but Islam is not Salam. Islam, the translation of Islam is not Salam. Uh, I, and I, I want to emphasize that because we, we should be peacemakers. Muslims should be peacemakers. I should be, as a husband, I should be a peacemaker at home with my family. As a, as a son, I should be a peacemaker at home with my parents. As a, as a cousin, I should be a peacemaker at home with my relatives. In society, I should be a peacemaker. Muslims should be known as peacemakers. But it's not a wishy-washy peace. Peace for the, just get peace under whatever cost. There needs to be justice. There needs to be hak, truth. There needs to be hidayah, guidance. It needs to be done under the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Okay. So, uh, so and the point I'm trying to make is whenever the microphone is under us, you know, and we're asked to say something. Oh, yes, Islam is peace. And by that, you know, oh, well, we will accept anything. We won't rock the boat. If we believe that Islam doesn't rock the boat, it means that the prophets and the messengers know the Bilman Dalit. They didn't know how to do that. Because in some cases, they rocked the boat. Okay? The minimum boat they rocked is they were uh, trying to uh, 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 remind the hearts of people. Life isn't about just eating and drinking, it's about some higher purpose. So that boat was wrong. And some people in society quite didn't like it. And so their boat was wrong. And they didn't do it for political sake, no. You know this, they didn't do this for political sake. Otherwise, the seerah tells us, right in the early age, in the times of Makkah, a few years into the public doubt, some of the Quraysh came to the Prophet Okay, okay, look, okay, look you, you made your point. We'll make you our king, and we won't take a decision without you. We'll give you all of our money, you'll be the richest, richest of us, if that's really what you want. If you want, if, if you're doing this because you want to marry the best of the women, then we'll give you our most uh, prettiest daughters. If you want to be the political leader, we won't take any decision without you. The Prophet said, no, that's not what I want. Because it wasn't about that. It's about Allah. So, Islam is istislam. Bear that in mind. Don't lose that translation. Islam is not salam, it's istislam. But hopefully, personal and hopefully societal peace will come the more istislam is truly done in China time. This struggle against, against the, self, the self is the ancient way of the prophets. It is the way of submission to the will of Allah who has constantly revealed His will mercifully throughout human history. Our God is mighty and transcendent, above and beyond the pettiness of this lower world. But He is also a personal and caring God who sustains and nourishes. This is the beauty of Islam. On the one hand, Allah lays the complete shape. And so the Quran says, there is nothing like Him. Okay? Whatever you imagine Allah to be, that's not Allah. Lays the complete shape. Okay? There's no waham, no... Uh, we can't imagine Allah, Jalla So in that sense, He is totally unlike his creation. And yet, Allah, closer to, closer to us than our jugular then. He's with, with you wherever you are. On the one hand, he's, as, as they say, out there, other than, other than, other other than. And at the other sense, he's closer to us, caring for us, wanting to do good for us, ready to listen to our du'as. When we're weeping to him, and no one else knows it, Allah hears and sees and He wants to respond and, he, uh, and His love is open and accessible and that's a feature of Islam Islam sometimes unites two opposites okay on the one hand Islam is Jalali, very mighty and strong and there's some strictness and on the other hand it's very Jalali, very soft, gentle and beautiful you have Isa al Islam, very Jalali, very soft, gentle character. You have Musa al Islam, Prophet Moses, very Jalali, very. And you have the Prophet Asim, very Kanali. It unites both of them. Okay. This is one of the features of Islam. It unites what look like two opposites. Okay. So our Lord, on the one hand, so this is why we never despair. I may not hear you, you you're struggling, and you say, oh, Allah, can you? I've got, I've got no time, bro. No, one was, no one's listening, our parents don't understand us, maybe a generation out of sync, a generation and a half, they're, li they're living back in their 70s, I'm in the year 2015, what do they know? Who can I turn to? The Mawlwi in the mosque, what does he know? He just knows, you know, Quran, some hadith, what does... Allah! Allah is still there. So if any person thinks that human beings are letting them down, we Muslims are letting Muslim youths down, maybe we are. But Allah will never let me down. Allah Jalla Ma'ala will never let me down. Because He is closer to you than your job in the And what that what he's trying to say there is, put your needs to Allah. Make your tears for him. He will always okay. He will never ever fail. We will fail each other. Allah will never fail. Anyway, they continue like this, and one of the things that um, Sheikh Hamza mentions in his commentary is he he uh, he he looks at the, he says, 
Yet now, the present state of the people of this ancient path is as you see. We are powerless, bereft, morally bankrupt, objects of history unlike our pious predecessors who were the subjects of history. We're just objects. People speak about us and write about us and we're Muslims, they become radical ideas and they become mad and whatever. We're just, you know, in academic books there's lots about us. They were subjects, they made history with them. People used to see them and subhanAllah, and I'm not talking about the ulama amongst them only. I'm talking about really the, the simple trader amongst them. They, all of these people are awliya with, with, the, with the, the people of God. And just by their simple actions and statements, and it, there was something to marvel at. So subhanAllah, their honesty and their integrity, let alone their, their conviction, their yaqeen. So we're subjects, and they were actually... Uh, well, uh, sorry, they were subjects of history, really just objects. So unlike uh, our pious predecessors who were subjects of history, engaging with the world, engaging the world with the sword of truth and dispelling darkness with the power of their spiritual light, we are sad, anxious, impotent, indolent. Indolent means lazy. Debt-ridden, cowardly, miserly, and overpowered by the worst elements of humanity. It is as if we've never recited or even heard the prayer of the Prophet of the du'a of the Prophet of Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from grief and anxiety, from impotence and indolence, from cowardly and cowardice and miserliness, and from being overcome by debt and overcome by people. It's one of the, it's, it's a du'a and it's also recommended to say morning and evening as well. Point being is, the Prophet of made du'a against laziness and anxiousness and being overcome by debt and, the very things that he taught us to make du'a from, for is the very things we tend not to do and we are steeped in it. It's a bad condition. And then he says, then, then the two shirts say, the question arises, so this is the crux before I start the first point. The question arises, how did we get into such a state? Now, some people will tell you, okay, this is not what they're saying, this is what I'm saying. Some people will tell us, oh, you know what, because we don't have enough military might. And so, uh, back in the late 19, 1900s, some of the Muslim countries started modernizing their army to keep it in line with the French and the, uh, and the British army or the kind of pattern. And therefore they said, well, you know, we need a marching band, because they had a marching band, and we need to do this, they have that, we need to do it this way because they're doing it that way. And we did it. Uh, Egypt did it as well. We did it. And Some people say, no, no, military is not their problem. We need to economically. So some people, in more recent times, try, are trying. And some of them are sincere, I have no doubt, okay? And others, well, who knows? You know, try to make riba as halal as possible. But riba, interest is interest. Better to, better to uh, deal with interest as a sinner then to try to make something halal, haram, halal, sorry, something to be, that is clearly prohibited to be permissible. That sin is worse than the sin of actually, I know it's haram and stuff, but I'm sinful. There's a hope there, there's a hope. I, I'm not encouraging sin there, right? I'm just saying that there's a hope because I know in my heart it's wrong. But if it's like, oh yeah, we'll just make it halal because it makes it easy, Islam is easy, right? Then that's changing the deen. The first one isn't changing the deen, it's just sinning. The second one is changing the deed. Okay. Um, so, and other people have offered, oh, we need better secular education. And I'm not saying that there isn't any truth in any of them. You know, it's not, you can't just dismiss military power, economic growth, or secular education. But they aren't the real reasons of how we got from what we used to be to more or less what we are now. Rather, how we got, they say, how, we, how did we get out of um, uh, sorry, and the uh, sorry, how did we get into this state? And the answer to that enables us to ask another more important question. How did we get out of that state? The response to the first question is painful and complex. Subsequently, the answer to the second question is also complicated and drawn out. However, we can bypass all of these ramifications, all of these details, okay, of both questions and arrive at a simple, profound uh, summative response, a summary to the response of how did we get there in this mess and how do we get out of this mess. And the summary of this is 
إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. Never does Allah change the condition of the people. Allah says in the Quran until they change what is in themselves. Never does Allah change the condition of the people until they change what is in themselves or until they change themselves. That's what Allah says. And this same in Allah la yughayru ma bikum in Allah Allah change the condition of the people until they change themselves. Not until they change their rulers, even if we have shabby tyrants in a lot of the countries. But until we change ourselves, the rule of the rulers, until we reconnect. The same message is given when in a particular battle, this is the second major battle, the battle of Uhud, the Muslims were winning, and then at the end the Muslims had to retreat in a mountaintop. In the beginning, the, Muslim, the, the enemy were running away. <coughs> By the end of the battle, the Muslims had to retreat. Okay, and so some of the mushrik of the Quraysh were saying, "Yes, yes, this day for that day, and this yo day of Uhud for that day of Badr when you beat us." So we are equal now. And Omar Rathiyan was in the mountain of the process and said, "Don't say anything, nobody." Okay, <coughs> because they had taken them. You know, it was it, it was quite severe. Uh, Umar al-Mashadabis, <laughs> he said, no, we are not equal because your dead are in hellfire and our dead are in paradise. Mashallah. <laughs> Which is true. Uh, but the point being is, even on that day, when they asked, how did this, this setback happen? The Quran says, it didn't say, well, you see, there was this non-Muslim general and he was a very good war tactician and he came from the back and he did the and he scattered the Muslims and the, because that's what happened, actually. Quran just simply says, "Pull one in Indi, and for say this calamity, say it happened because of yourselves." Allah put the blame on the Muslims, but the Muslims are the ones who are fighting for the truth. Why are they getting blamed? Why is this verse putting the putting the responsibility on the Muslims? Never does Allah change the condition of a people until you change yourselves. In the hadith in the Sunnah of Abu Dawud, the Sahih hadith in Shah, the Prophet said, إِذَا تَبَعَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَأَخَذْتُمْ أَثْنَابُ الْبَقْرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِزَرِ وَتَرَقْتُمُ الْجِهَانِ صَلَّتَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلَّةً لَا يَنْزِعُ بَعَنْكُمْ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى دِينِكُمْ When you deal in Ina, a form of, a very subtle way of using uh, interest or riba in, in buying and selling. When you deal in Ina, hold on to the tails of the cow and content yourself with agriculture. And it's just a dunya lifestyle. As long as I've got the latest Merc, the curved Samsung Plasma TV, and got my leather sofa settees, and got this, and got that, and I'm hopefully I'm going to go to Dubai World Cup in 2022, or whatever, Qatar World Cup. And it's just doing, and all these things in, in and of themselves are halal. I mean, leaving the issue of TV and what's on it, but I'm talking about a piece of technology. But they become our goal because we're just chasing dunya. Okay. And even the fact that when men wear shorts, the hour wear shorts. But we won't get into that. When you're dealing in that, hold on to the tails of the cow and content yourself with agriculture. Uh, agriculture. This is like a kinaya, like a metaphor or a figurative speech for just dunya, just chasing worldliness and materialism. And you abandon um, a jihad, striving in the path of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen to what the Prophet said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah, this is very frightening, Allah will permit your humiliation. Allah himself will permit your humiliation and he will not lift this humiliation from you until you return to your religion. Not because we left our religion and we're now all non-Muslim, no kuffar, no Muslim, no, no, no. no. It means until you return to the practice of your religion. How do we know that? Because when we turn back to the books of commentary, of shuru, of this hadith, that's what they say. Okay? And we need to turn back to the words of the ulama because they best understand the words of the Prophet because of the unbroken chain. They learn from teachers, learn from teachers, learn from all the way back to the original source of Allah. So, hatta tariju ila until you return to your religion, means until you return to acting upon what your religion instructs. Again, another example of never does Allah change the condition of a pe people until they change themselves. Just to show how much it's repeated in the Quran, in the teachings of the Prophet and that really 
This should be second nature to us, and yet in our political narrative and discourse, we never mention these things. It's always the ruler's fault, it's always this party's fault, it's always the Kufar's fault, it's always the United Nations fault, it's always Israel's fault, it's always this person's fault, it's always this. It's always someone else's fault. And never one time do we say, oh, well, actually, you know what? In the Quran itself, it wants Muslims to take more of the responsibility. I'll give you one, ex one more example of this, as I said. The Quran says, Surah Muhammad, Ya ayyuhaladina amu, in tansurullah, yansurkum, wa yuthabbit, qadamu. Or you who believe, if you help Allah, Allah will help you, and establish your feet firmly. And the meaning of this is, establish your feet firmly means, he will help you against your enemies. Okay? But how do we how do we help Allah when Allah is al Fani? Allah is uh, independent, self-sufficient. Allah needs nothing outside of Himself. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the needy. Antumul Fuqara. We are the needy ones. Allah will Ghani uh, 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 Hamid. Allah is al Fani. The word in Allah, if you help Allah means if you act upon what Allah has commanded you with, Allah will help you. Not if you know what Allah has commanded you with, but if you act upon what Allah has commanded you with. Of course, knowledge comes first. Isn't that what Imam, Imam al-Bukhari says? Al-ilm qabl al-qawl wal-amal wa dalil qawl ta'ala fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah fabada'a bi ilm. Knowledge comes before speech and action. And the proof of this is Allah saying, uh, so have knowledge of La ilaha illallah. So he began with knowledge and before uh, the action. And the action in this verse is, so have knowledge of La ilaha illallah and seek forgiveness of your sins. So the action of seeking forgiveness came only after having knowledge that Allah is the one who forgives sins because this is part of his Okay. No doubt knowledge is important, but if you act upon that which Allah has commanded you, Allah will help you against your enemies. So the whole thing is about the it, Allah puts the responsibility squarely, squarely on our Muslims. If, for example, I say, you know what, we Muslims are in a right state being persecuted and injustice or whatever, and, and I'm a type of person that is regularly disobeying my parents, I am part of the problem, not part of the solution. Why? Every sin, especially that level of sin, because it's after shit, right? Okay. It, you can't really get worse than this about your parents. Okay. Shall I not tell you the worst of the major sins? Bala ya Rasulullah. Indeed, the Prophet of Allah tells us. He said, Al ishraqu billah wa uqooqul walidayn wa fi riwayat al ukhra wa uqooqul ummahat. Shall I not tell you the worst of the sins? They said, Yes, Messenger Allah tell us. He said, Committing shit, associating partners with God. And then, disobedience to and in another direction, disobedience to mothers. So whilst I'm doing that, right, because it's a laddish thing to do, actually I'm drawing upon myself and maybe it's spreading the ghadab, the anger of Allah. Right? And maybe, I'm not saying definitely, maybe I'm making dua and Allah's you, I'm, there's a veil between you, your dua and me because of your disobedience. Especially to the one who gave you birth in this life. We can only be part of the solution when we are making efforts. Even if we sin through Tawbah and rectifying our conduct and trying to improve, then we become part of the solution. But if we're carefree Muslims, like, you know what? What can Islam do for me? What can you do for Islam? That's a noble one. Islam can do a lot for us. But what will you do for this deen? If you can't do much, then the minimum is don't give it a bad name by doing sins. Okay. The lady Aisha anha, says, uh, the best of the deeds is, if you can't do good, then refrain from doing ill. And I think uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr, just before I came, I, I, I don't know, maybe he mentioned uh, that uh, a Muslim is he who from other uh, hands, Muslims uh, say for their son, uh, tongue in their hands? Muslim. So you mentioned that, yes? So look at this beautiful hadith. The Muslim is he from whom other Muslims are safe? Uh, 
and then you mention the muhajir, okay? But the Muslim, let's just stick with the Muslim, right? That level we need to try to work on, okay? No good having all of this political fiery talking. Yeah, we're going to do this. We're gonna... But I can't, I can't stop uh, harming others with my tongue. Your reputation is not safe from my tongue. You're gonna, I'm going to salam. You're going to, you're going to turn your back on me, and I'm going to cuss you. I'm going to, I'm going to call you. I'm going to speak ill of you on my hand. How can that be as a Muslim? Even if we disagree, then there is a. There is an adab of disagreement. Yes, you, you, I know, I believe you're wrong. But let's come round the table with some arbiter and let's decide. No, no, no. As a husband or as a wife, I'm going to use the children in the war. Right? Children this three, four, two years old, whatever. And two adults are going to use the children to get at their former spouses. Out the middle and I believe down to the end. Oh, she, I've got my hijab on and I'm wearing it, and I'm going to use the children like that. Was the dean just a few years here and a, and a hijab? <coughs> this is part of dean, Bilal Chuck. But is it part of dean not to use innocent creatures in your own personal walls? But yes, you can. Husband and wife can fall out. So, more for the Muslim man. My brothers. I don't know, I don't want to uh, uh, embarrass myself by saying elders, but brothers, the Quran says to us, either keep them in kindness, in kindness, not keep them, in kindness, or release them in kindness. It's, yes, we might not get along, wrong choice, or the whole situation changed, in the beginning it was brilliant and now it's not working. And then it's this, the wisest, sensible thing to do is to part ways. Not always, but let's just say it is the case. Then, in kindness, it is maybe a little bit bad, but don't get the children and don't start, you know, using the mahar here and the dog gift there and this there and, you know, we'll cut the, um, I don't know, we'll cut the sofa set in half because we both pay. Christ, let the Muslim man, let the Muslim man, let the Muslim man, whoever told you that the Muslim man is the one who pulls over his shirt and you check out my hair, Look at what a man I am. Baboons! Baboons have air on their chest more than we do. Are they men? No. The man is the one who has an other, who looks like maybe they are the softer, gentle creatures, the wives, the women. Treat women nicely. Okay, it didn't work out, so at the least I can do is be nice in the ending, if maybe I wasn't so nice during the middle of the story. Please. Because the sunnah is not just about the hat on the head and a few other people. The sunnah is the real deal. It's the real human deal. So, inna Allah la yuma yuma That's uh, That's the focus of this book. And what this book will do, jumping the gun here, is I'm going to read the 20 points, the headings, just for today so we know what we're talking about next week. And then they have a little paragraph for each heading. 20 principles to change ourselves. One, form a serious study group to learn the five pillars properly and thoroughly. That study group, you will see, can either be at the feet of the ulama or together, but without the ulama, but always being in contact with the ulama and saying, Allah knows best what we don't know. But learn the five pillars. Not, well, I know there's, you know, the shahada is salah, zakah, and hajj, and so on. But learn them thoroughly so that we can avoid simple mistakes. So now it's hot, uh, and, you know, I'm wearing a t-shirt, okay, but now I've come to prayer actually, even though it's not haram, okay, to have half sleep, but it's disliked. It's not, it's not the etiquette. Uh, we wouldn't get married in a half sleep t-shirt and come to our wedding, no, no. Even on a baking day, we will be to those times, even on a baking day, most people are gonna wear some jacket or whatever. But for prayer, we will do half sleep. No, Allah has more right than we beautify ourselves for And we would know that that was disliked because we learned the basic rules of prayer. We may not know the dalil or the hadith or whatever, but we learned it from qualified people or qualified book, which practically means one of the four from the existing schools. So form a serious study group to thoroughly learn the five pillars. Two, create an active dawah program 
designed to produce results. Three, find an area of concern that instills a passionate response in you and, be, and begin to work to alleviate, to relieve the obstacles needed to produce the change you want to see. So for example, poverty, I want to work to help reduce poverty or eliminate poverty in the world, then we commit to that. Four, the deen is based on recognizing the ability of the believers that make up the ummah and facilitating for them the use of their respective gifts. Understand that if one person focuses in one area that differs from your area of concern, he or she is com complementing your work and not distracting or competing against you. Okay, so we don't have rivalry and partisanship when we're doing the work, okay? Uh, which is always a, always a problem. That's all I'll have uh, that's, that was four. Number five is, well, unless I, I can't see number five here. Uh, I'll look at that again, but I can immediately see number six. Inculcate good character as practice and be courteous with Muslims and non-Muslims uh, Seven, maintain excellent kinship bonds, bonds of relative relations, and forgive the shortcomings of your relatives for the sake of the Allah in the hope that he may forgive your shortcomings by doing so for the sake of Allah. Sometimes it's really achieved, but we just want to make one point. I, I see this often, but I'll protect us. So, we're very loose on anything of enjoying the good for being evil. Something haram happens to me, we don't even feel it in the heart. But my relative, any of my cousins or uncles or aunties or does anything wrong, stuff for Allah, we're not going to their house, how they disobey Allah. Well, all of a sudden I became like Mr. Pius, right? I didn't advise, I didn't try to give them nasiha, I didn't make dua for them, and I didn't use even the same standards on myself, because if I look at myself or my little, it's even worse than my relative. But no, 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 I have. So we can sometimes use the religion to think we're doing piety, but actually it's the ego. And the ego is at, is at its worst when it, when it clothes itself in the sharia. Okay? The ego, the nafs, is always at its worst when it dresses up as children. Uh, eight, treat your wives with excellence. A man is judged in this religion by how well he treats his wives and children. And understand that. You want to know who is mutamassikun on the sunnah? Look at the way he treats his mothers, wives, daughters. Okay? Not how long his beard or, or, or turban is. Nine, ask Allah every day to purify your heart with some of the du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ten, donate some, of, some portion of your wealth on top of zakah in charity. Eleven, read the Qur'an in its entirety, kamil in khatam, at least twice a year. Once in Ramadan, once outside, at least. Okay? Because we're supposed to be ahl of Qur'an, people of Qur'an. Okay? I don't mean people of Qur'an as in like that kind of Pervasi group in Pakistan. I'm talking about, you know, this is our Muslim inshallah. Um, te uh, Twelve, commit to a serious practice of the Serious practice. Right, right. All right, so just me two, two minutes, inshallah. Uh, Thirteen, learn the rules of enjoying good and forbidden evil, which is very important. Fourteen, avoid judging and criticizing people and cultivate mercy and empathy. Fifteen, pray every day, make dua every day for your brothers and sisters who are being afflicted throughout the world. Sixteen, take care of your body, which is a big thing. Seventeen, make sincere commitment to Allah's deen. Uh, 18, commit yourself to being a person of taqwa. That this is what I want to do, Allah, make me a person of taqwa. 19, utilize your time. Do not allow the thief to steal the precious gift of time. And 20, make khidmah. Serve your, uh, serve your Lord and honor your parents and treat the Muslim brothers and sisters well and be, a, be on the path of journeying to Allah amongst them. Those are the 20 practical points we want to do. These applies to young and old, male and female. Western and Eastern, we're all in need of something of it, inshallah. May Allah Jalla wa'ala give us tawfiq, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to understand and act upon the best of what we read and understand. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of taqwa, people of beauty, people of sunnah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the Ammayyazi Qur'an, as-salamu alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.